Hello and welcome to Farside Farmaker, a podcast with John Mark Osborne and Michael Richard talking about everything Farmaker. Hello, this is Michael Richard. Today we're going to listen to part two of the most fascinating conversation John and I have had in a long time with Rick Kalman and Robert Holsey of Claris International talking about where Farmaker is, how they manage it and where they're going with it. Enjoy the podcast. Tell us a little bit about Claris Connect and how it's going to exist, uh, how it's going to fold into the existing product development cycle. Uh, I believe that, uh, and I won't even try to pronounce his name, I'll let you do it. Uh, the gentleman who was, uh, you know, running the stamp play, uh, Giuliano, and I can't even try his last name, is going to be the product manager. Which, uh, go for it again. It's Iacobelli, I think. Yep. I've heard people say Iacobelli, but I think you are actually correct, Michael. Yeah, so um, it is a separate product. You know, as as you've stated, you know, we've gone from becoming or being FileMaker Inc. to um, being Claris. And of course, history-wise, people may be aware that um, we our origins are in a company named Claris. Uh, and when um, we formed FileMaker Inc., we focused right on um, the FileMaker product line. Um, and, um, with the rebranding, we're taking that name again, and we're also adding additional products just like Claris had, uh, back in the day. And, um, so it's a separate product, um, with a separate team, uh, and run on a separate schedule. So it's not at the same, you know, release schedules as FileMaker. In fact, it will be coming out, um, prior to the next release of, of the FileMaker platform. Uh, and, uh, it can of course, work with um, FileMaker, with FileMaker Cloud, and with FileMaker on-premise, but it also isn't necessarily require FileMaker um, to, to, to work with it. Uh, so, um, you know, we're one team. All the product managers are under Srini, who's the new VP of product management and design. So we all work together. And, of course, everything is interrelated, um, but um, they work on separate schedules as, as well as FileMaker Cloud, which has its own release schedule. So we really don't have this once a year monolithic, you know, release anymore. Um, you know, if you were at DevCon, um, you heard us announce that um, our next generation of FileMaker Cloud that doesn't require you to go to Amazon AWS, go through the marketplace, have an engagement with Amazon and also with FileMaker, but you just come to us, you're up and running really quick. That's coming out at the end of October. Then our intent is... Um, early next year that the first release of Claris Connect comes out and it will be our first Claris branded product. Uh, and then uh, we'll follow that with um, um, by FileMaker um, platform release. And, and then after that, um, I think that you'll see us um, iterating much faster um, in, in the future uh, and not everything just sort of hitting once, once, a, um, uh, once a year. Do you think that um, you're going? That Claris is going to be on more of an acquisition cycle now by buying products like Stamplay rather than developing it internally. It's a potential. Um, you know, uh, if we could find other acquisitions of the caliber of Stamplay, uh, and it made sense to our long-term strategy, um, yeah, definitely, it's something that that we would look at. Um, and, you know, we've done acquisitions uh, in, in the past, um, you know, sometimes just technology. Uh, people who remember CDML may have realized that it was something created by Blue World that was Lasso 1.1, and we acquired that technology. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's something that uh, we'll look at as we broaden out our portfolio. Um, we'll keep our eye open. There's, which We're definitely not closed to it uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, uh, that's, uh, it's a perfectly le legitimate way to, um, to sort of jump. You know, it would have taken us years to build um, what Stamplay had already built. Uh, and the fact that we can go from introducing the workplace innovation platform last uh, August and talking about 
the integration um, uh, category of that, and a year later come back and say, um, we have a new workflow engine that will integrate uh, hundreds, if not thousands of services out there um, without having to worry about, you know, endpoints and, and, you know, all of the complexity of APIs, uh, you can just drag and drop. Um, that would have been impossible for us to do in a year without stopping to do everything else. So, you know, when it makes sense, it makes sense. And, uh, you know, it's uh, an exciting new, new product for us to have. Well, as somebody who has struggled with the API um, stuff because I'm not a real programmer. I'm just pure file maker and API stuff is over my head. And to be honest, I'm not terribly interested in it, but I'm terribly excited about what Claris Connect will be able to do. Yeah. I mean, that's really FileMaker and now Claris's DNA. I mean, if you think about it, we're really trying to take um, very powerful capabilities and technologies and make them accessible to someone who's trying to solve a specific business problem. And they're probably not a computer programmer. They're not a DBA. They're not an IT person. They're not a classically trained person. But they are certainly adept at being able to put these things together. And, you know, uh, you're trying to solve a problem. So do you really want to spend 35 hours trying to figure out how to connect FileMaker to a data source? Or do you just want to come into the product and say, I need to connect this to that? And boom, you do it. Uh, and then you take those extra, you know, 32 hours or 33 hours you have left over and apply them to solving other problems. So um, I'm with you is, um, you know, I'm, I was, remember, I was the lead webmaster. And I came out of an era where if you were doing web pages, you were writing uh, HTML. Um, and then the WYSIWYG HTML editors came out there. There was, uh, you know, Adobe had one, Claris had one, the Claris homepage. Uh, and there were purists that said, no, you know, you've got to hand code or else you don't know what you're doing. But the people that went to the WYSIWYG HTML editors started cranking out web pages in orders of magnitude, more productivity than the ones that were hand coding it. And out of that, we had an explosion of the internet economy. Um, because, and so I think FileMaker is that same way. Do you really want to futz around um, getting to the end that you're seeking? Or do you want FileMaker to do the hard work so that you can um, you can get to that end uh, rather than spending the time uh, doing to get it? And, and I think that opening up the RESTful API to all of our developer community, um, rather than just the small percentage that really knows that is a huge leap forward. Yeah, I think it's important to note uh, something about what Rick is saying that maybe is obvious to some people and not to others is that Claris Connect is its own product without FileMaker, but it enhances FileMaker tremendously. So hopefully people who don't really understand Claris Connect yet will at least understand that it's going to make your FileMaker much better. Yep, well said, John Mark. Thanks for that clarification. Well, I think it's also going to do another thing, Rick, and the, the thing you said, you know, who wants to spend 35 hours building an API? Well, the truth of the matter is the client doesn't want to pay for that. So if we can eliminate the cost of billing for that time that we're saving, not even if we're just saving the time to do something else, but by being able to do it quickly and easily, we can keep the development cost down for the client and deliver a solution faster and cheaper. Yeah, I think there's going to be a symbiotic relationship there because some have thought, well, okay, well, that's billable hours I'm losing. It's like, no, you're spending 30 hours doing something that if you could do in two, what would you do with those other 28 hours? And, um, right. Um, and, uh, so, you know, you're going to, you can get another client or you can impress that client clicker. You're going to uh, quicker. You're going to keep that quiet client longer. We all know the, the lifetime value of a single client if um, you hold on to them. Right. Uh, and it's, it can be quite, quite a bit. I mean, I've, I've been a consultant as well uh, and it's uncanny. Right. So 
the more you can deliver, uh, uh, you know, the the better relationship you you have uh, with them. Uh, the more things you can say yes to, um, and you don't have to pull your hair out and work over the weekend trying to make it happen. Then I think it floats everyone's boat. Yeah, Robert, are you still there? Because we've lost you for the moment. That's too bad. Uh, probably uh, we've lost him for the rest of the interview, but uh, Rick's doing a pretty good job. So I think you wanted to ask about uh, another question about Claris Connect, about competitors. Yeah, I mean, Zapier is, from what I understand, it does the same thing as Claris Connect. Um, am I correct in that? And was there a, was it just that it was too well established? The cost of buying it was too high and Stanplay was just a better deal? <clears throat> well, first of all, um, Zapier does similar things, um, but not exactly. So similar in the sense of making easy connections. If you're also aware with, of, of if this, then that, it's similar as well. Uh, if this, then that is literally um, what it says. So it's, it's limited <clears throat> in the number of things that you can string together. Um, but, um, and Zapier has more power. Um, but um, there are, is even more power in Claris Connect uh, than that for uh, developers, especially. Now you, you don't need to do this, but you can extend um, you can extend out the capability. You can do things much closer uh, to what you're used to doing with a combination of scripts, calculations, and logic, um, and do some very powerful things that you're just not going to get. Um, even from Zapier. Now, we also, we were never considering acquiring uh, something like, like Zapier. <clears throat> we would have more partnered with them. And again, the downside to that is that then the customer has to go to multiple, you know, if, if they want to do integration and FileMaker, then they've got to, you know, have a, an account and, and pay Zapier. They've got to, you know, have an account with FileMaker. Uh, and if you're trying to do it with FileMaker or the Claris side, it's just easier to come with a one-stop shop. That's exactly, you know, one of the reasons that we, we're doing our own cloud now as well is so that we can control the onboarding experience. You're not using a different language. You don't have to have a relationship with another vendor unless, of course, if you want that. And it's just uh, much easier to, to get up and going and running. I'm hoping that Robert's finally back. Are you there, Robert? I'm hoping so, too. Yeah. So, and this is perfect because the next question is for you. Um, so you talked a little bit about save as XML feature. I'd like you to talk about what it means today and what you can tell us about what it might mean for the future. Cause I'm really interested in this feature a tremendous amount. Sure. Yeah. So we, um, our, our our grand vision for this is is really as I was talking about earlier, sort of introducing the portability that um, you know many in the community have tried to tackle in FileMaker today, and um, you know there's been some success there, but we believe there's a, a better approach. Uh, we started working on it. I want to say with FileMaker 17, I can't remember exactly, but I know in 17 is where we introduced the add-on tables and our new starter apps. Um, so. Uh, many don't realize this, but when you launch FileMaker 17 uh, and, of course, 18, uh, in the Launch Center, when you under, under the Create tab, there's six starter apps. And those six starter apps actually do not exist on disk as FMP12 files. There's actually a folder that has um, a couple of sets of XML files. One is the core structure, and the other is actually a series of them, uh, each language, all the strings in each of the languages. And so when you go into the launch center and you hit create on one of those starter apps, behind the scenes, FileMaker is taking those two XML files and stitching them together, together to ultimately create your file. Uh, one immediate win there is in the um, localization case. Uh, instead of us creating a version of that app for each of our languages, uh, we essentially create that app once and then have our localization team put the strings in so that we can then, based off the region that the customer is in, create that file for them on the fly. Similarly, when you go through the portal setup in FileMaker 17 and 18, you may have noticed that there's a new option called you know, new from table, I believe, or new from add-on table. And that brings up some UI. And in that, we've got 11 add-on tables 
which again do not re are not represented on disk uh, in any other form than XML. And what that allows us to do is take that XML and actually inject it into your file. So we're bringing over the schema, the relationships, the layouts, everything that's necessary for you to create that relationship, store that data, and then present that to the user. And that was really us sort of uh, if proof of concept is not really the right word because it was obviously a completely finished feature that we put into the product, but it, it sort of helped us validate uh, where we want to take things. Um, with FileMaker 18, we added the X save as XML option in the menu uh, as well as a script step. Um, part of that was us sort of completing uh, the full representation of the file. Uh, in 17, we focused on the objects, the elements that we needed in order to create those specific starter apps, those specific add-ons. So things like, uh, I think popovers were one thing that we didn't have uh, the ability to serialize and deserialize as XML yet. But with 18, the goal is to get 100% fidelity or as close to it as we can. That then starts opening up the, uh, for a future where again, the community, once they've created some awesome element, be able to turn that on into an add-on and start sharing that either within their own org to you know, reuse elements in the future, uh, or better yet, start sharing that with the community through our marketplace, uh, and really, again, taking that power and making it available to everybody. I know one of the features that, that I created with the FileMaker 18 Save as XML feature was the ability to compare two files. And I just imported the two XML generated files from the old version and the new version, then compared them, and it would come up with a list showing you so that's pretty cool stuff you can do with it now. It sounds to me like what you're saying is there's a possibility that you might be able to create an XML file that completely represents your FileMaker file and could possibly rebuild it. That's exactly where we want to head. Um, and so that helps us for things like validating that there's no corruption in a file. Uh, but the other thing that I'm really excited about that setting us up for is pushing updates to your file. You know, version management is a huge pain in the community right now that we hear loud and clear. You know, one of our first steps was the data migration tool that we introduced so that at least you didn't have to go through a manual import process, you know, between your V1 and your V2 version. Uh, but we want to take that even farther and say, you've got your production version, you've got your changes that you need to push up to that. Um, and XML will be the vehicle that allows us to do that. Just to clarify that, this sounds very interesting. Are you saying that you'll be able to literally update the original file with an XML update, which would just contain the changes or would it contain all of the XML for that entire file solution? Uh, so the goal would be that you'd be able to save the copy, very similar to what you're doing today, uh, where you save the V1 version, the V2 version, and you start looking at the differences. And then you could basically create out of that a installer file, for lack of a better term, um, that are those changes. Uh, now we still have work to do there. You know, we're looking at how we do um, sort of replace. Like I, I have this uh, tab control that has some elements on it, and I want to update that. Is that going to be a replace of that entire object? Um, part of this is also making sure that we've got unique identifiers for all objects across the uh, all objects across the um, the app. Uh, so there is work that we're we're still fleshing out, but that's where we want to get to is we want to try to automate this experience as much as possible. Um, and that's, you know, the, again, the XML is the road we're paving uh, to get us there. That's fascinating. Are there any new features coming down the pipeline that you guys can actually talk about? Any favorite features of yours that you might just give us some insight? I understand if you can't say some, certain things, but it can't hurt to ask either, I guess. I'll say from my side, um, you know, there's definitely some some uh, blue sky ideas that we're exploring with the engineering team, and it just I don't think would be uh, beneficial for anyone to talk about those yet. But the, the the more immediate stuff that I've been talking about, you know, with the responsive layouts, the XML, I think those alone are the things that you know will drastically change how we build in FileMaker today. You know, so much of building an app is is building each piece individually you know we all have our tip you know our tricks and, and and third party tools that we use to try to um reuse components as much as possible but it's very difficult and it's not something that a new filemaker developer even has visibility to yet 
Um, and so when you look at add-ons, uh, again, enabled by our XML, uh, and then the, the sort of changes that responsive layouts or the, the enhancements to the, the overall experience of the apps, I think those two things coming together are going to be game-changing, again, as far as how and what types of apps we build on the platform. Any, any comments on that, Rick? <clears throat> no, other than um, there's no specific feature in the next release that you know, we can really talk about at this point, other than what I'll say is that um, we'll do another roadmap um, webinar probably in the November uh, time frame and talk more specifically about what's coming uh, down the pike in the next release, uh, and then um, beyond that, um, you know where we're heading. Uh, we've been doing that for the last several years, and I believe we'll continue that. Uh, and then, um, you know, come around March time is when we typically do preview webinars, and we'll share all of the um, new 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 features. This year at DevCon, we didn't even really do a product demo like we typically do because we did a visionary keynote. Uh, and some of what we showed is definitely in the next release, but we didn't really call it out. So um, I don't want to steal any thunder from the, the from the marketing and, and sales side of the house. Um, so I, I can't really talk about anything more specific than that. How much uh, influence does Apple have over the direction of FileMaker and specific features? Uh you know that's a that's a fair question. Um, certainly, Apple doesn't um, you know dictate uh, any of that stuff to to us, and we're able to, uh, to you know to run as an independent organization. Um, we work you know as closely with Apple as possibly can, and we certainly seek out um, uh, their advice on the things that they're knowledgeable about. Uh, knowledgeable about. Um, so um, you know we have a great symbiotic relationship, uh, and um, you know, I think we have the best of, of, of both worlds. And other than that, I'm, you know, really not authorized to talk about anything specifically related to, to Apple or our relationship. Um, but, um, you know, it's, um, the, the, you know, it's, it's, that's a good one. So our next question, and we may be getting into the realm of, of where, uh, you may not be able to answer things, but that's okay. We, we, we ask them and we hope for something and, uh, you know, and maybe we'll get what we want. Maybe we won't. It's, you know, it's an interview. So, um, now so many, we talked a little bit about this before, but so many competitors separate the data and the interface and why i mean filemakers always had them together and i think that's for ease of use are there any other reasons why because i want to dispel this theory it, it, this is my kind of one of my goals is to, is that that the separation of of the interface and the data is a good idea i think it's a bad idea and i've talked about it quite a bit written articles and and convinced a lot of people not to do it is there any other reason other than ease of use i mean cuz you can imagine working with the the separated interface and data as it is right now it's very difficult having to switch between the different files and put a field in here and then go back here and then do the interface and they're small moves but they take up time and i've constantly told people you know don't do it is there any other reason why filemaker from your perspective either robert or rick has everything in one file other than ease of use uh, you know, not that I am aware of, you know, it's probably an historic artifact of how it was originally created. I think it does essentially lend itself to, you know, the ease of use, sort of that, you know, what is the secret sauce of, of FileMaker, right? It's all the things that it takes care of that you don't have to worry about. And so how it does that is being intimately aware of uh, what's going on, right? And, and it's sort of, um, you know, if you change the name of the field, we're going to take care of it for you. That, that kind of thing that, you know, other people, you know, uh, other products, uh, don't um, don't offer right, and so I think it's just part of what FileMaker is. You know, we certainly get uh, why you know there's a especially for when you're talking about updating things that you could update the interface, but the data is still there in the background, uh, and and but you know there's still an uh, interconnection. Um, that makes that uh, that, that difficult uh, potentially, um, and I think that you know going forward there'll be less of a need for that when we're able to infuse schema through XML and that sort of thing. But uh, it probably is 
fundamentally about uh, the ease of use. I don't know if there's anything else beyond that. That's more of a question you'd have to ask Clay you know, if you get him on a podcast one of these days. Yeah, it would be awesome, wouldn't it? Now, the next question I have is about live database development. And what I mean by that is some developers will do work on a database that's already on server being hosted and people are currently using it. Others say, absolutely not. I would never do that even to add one little tiny button or one script. I would go and take the whole database down import the new features, you know, put the new version up there, and then, you know, have, having worked offline on it first. I've been doing live database development, not from scratch. I'm not suggesting that you put the database up there and define all the schema and that, but once a database has gone through the first revision, the first, you know, it's completed, people obviously are going to have new features, and it's a time saver for me to go into the live database and add a simple little report layout. And so what I'm asking is, and I know that, uh, you know, in the past, FileMaker has made live development with certain releases better and easier to do, specifically back in, I think it was 3.0 V5. They added the ability to make certain changes in managed database, whereas you wouldn't, weren't even able to go into managed database before. And so they've, they've obviously supported this, but I've gotten feedback from lots of people that live database development is not a good idea. And I just, you know, wanted to get your viewpoint from a technical perspective, knowing the engine, what that means for FileMaker. Uh, Robert, coming from tech support, you may have some insight onto this. I think a lot is going to depend on the nature of the app that's being deployed, how many people are simultaneously using it, what kind of things they are doing, what kind of things you're changing. You know, are you fiddling around with global fields or calcs, you know, those kinds of things. So I think it's dependent. Robert, do you have any sage uh, wisdom on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, Live development is something that, uh, it, you know, it, it's part of what FileMaker is. I mean, we see it all the time and we strive as a team to ensure that that works well. Um, that said, do I blame someone who understands technology and understands that, you know, we have to send data back to a server to, to be committed? And if something on the network goes awry and packets don't come across perfectly and we happen to have a bug and you know three other things line up that maybe some file corruption could happen that person is probably not being over paranoid because technology has those issues period nothing you know nothing specific to file maker um, but as a team as what we strive for we strive for you know for that to be the case you know especially as we start moving it to cloud um, you know, we fully expect people to be creating apps up on the cloud and be modifying them and not having to bring them back down to a local client. Um, and you're seeing, you know, at, at DevCon, we talked a lot about being, you know, uh, web first and, and web, you know, having a big part of um, the future of the platform. And if you're doing development through that, that's all going to be live. Um, so I think that that's part of what makes FileMaker magical. But I do understand. I, I do understand the folks that have those concerns. Uh, I've I'd heard it over the years when I was in support, um, but I think as we're doing more and more, as you know, Rick mentioned the uh, being able to push schema changes. You know, where we can have more of a production versus a development environment. Uh, I think we'll have better answers for those people that want to be absolutely positively sure that everything is is um, uh, locked down from a you know, things that are in production versus development. So I think we've got some good options coming for those folks. Yeah, it's very good. I do a lot of live development, but I don't, if I have to go in, it has to be on the surface. In other words, if I have to go into the managed database or add new fields, I don't do it while everybody's working on it. That's when I go in at night and do it when everybody's gone home. Uh, but to be able to just go in and add a report or, you know, just, you know, add a new layout or add some buttons. I can't see any downside to being able to do that. And in fact, it's fabulous. So one of the areas I think that needs the most improvement at this point for me is an overhaul of the managed database that includes the tables, the fields, and the relationships graphs. And Specifically, I'd like to see folders, tabs, filters, and easier methods for locating table occurrences. What are your thoughts? Can you tell us anything about if that's even on your on your radar, or are there anything specific you can tell us? 
I'm looking for any kind of bone you can throw me. <laughs> yeah, I, it's definitely on our radar. You know, and as I, I sort of alluded to it earlier, you know, looking at, you know, why you're asking for those things. And, and again, that comes down to when I look at a lot of systems, um, I see that there's lots and lots of fields that are there just to, um, you know, store a value so that it can be um, uh, connect a relationship where you're really just trying to query data um, or just store some, you know, information that's really not relevant to what that table is really tracking. You know, you've got all your global fields in there. Um, and so we're looking at, are there better ways to tackle those problems so that you don't have this unmanageable list of fields that you need to track? Um, and so I'd rather tackle that problem first before we go in and start adding all of these other um, uh, options. Again, that said, though, when we look at sort of the future of developing in FileMaker, I, I wouldn't say that we would invest heavily in managed database, that dialogue. What you've, you know, we, we were talking about earlier, we started taking sort of alternative approaches to how to manage fields, as an example. And so we're, it's more of sort of a reimagining about, okay, given sort of where we want to go, given our current sort of expectations from developers, uh, both new and longtime developers, uh, let's just take a step back and figure out what's the right approach to this problem. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that we're uh, going to go in and, and uh, start building in a bunch of bells and whistles to manage database. I think we're looking at it at a, a little bit of a higher level. I, yeah, I completely understand. The only thing that um, you've already got that I think falls a little bit short is when you're looking for a table occurrence and you type something and it will highlight that table occurrence. but the highlighting or the way it's emphasized is so difficult to see and spot. I've sometimes stared at the screen for three minutes trying to figure out where it is. Is it possible to have kind of a more of a dramatic highlighting or a outline? Um, I mean, sure, it's possible. I'd have to go back and talk with the team. I think that's great feedback. Um, I hadn't heard that one specifically before, but uh, tweaks like that, you know, nothing, I don't want to sort of close the door on anything. We're, as I was saying earlier, we're always looking for, um, you know, low hanging fruit, things that will, can make an impact. Uh, so while we might not go in and heavily invest in reworking the managed database dialogue, if there were usability issues that were coming to our attention like that, absolutely. We would look at tweaking them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I'd have to agree with with uh, Michael on that one. I, I've I've stared at the screen for three minutes looking for what was highlighted. It it really is so difficult. See, at least I'm not sure about Windows because I develop on a Mac. It may be different, but you can't see it on, especially with a complicated uh, you know relationship graph. It can be very difficult to see which one you highlighted. Yeah, definitely. Good feedback. Now. I was going to ask about master layouts, but you already really covered it. And I think you called it nested layouts. So we're going to move on. I think uh, Michael has a series of questions he wants to ask that he specifically wrote to ask you guys. Right. So with the one year cycle, is that um, going to be indefinitely moving forward? Or do you see a point in time where you might not release a new version every year, but maybe every 18 years or whatever? 18. No, 18 months, I meant. <laughs> 18 years, I don't think so. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the reality is, I think, if anything, there's more of a chance we're move, we move faster um, than slower. But and we, get the, um, we, we get the complexity of having to do a version update, especially with server. Um, but the reality is many of the features that we ship, even on a yearly basis are done many, many, many months before we actually ship. And we're just sitting on that value. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at ways of being able to drop, um, additional functionality into the product, um, whenever, uh, whenever necessary, Robert, do you have anything else to, to say about that? Uh, no, I think you summed it up well. I mean, we're, we're focused on getting value out to all of you. I guess the only other thing I will say, because, you know, I've heard uh, concerns even about when we went to yearly about it being too frequent and being difficult uh, to keep your uh, your apps all updated and all your versions updated. Uh, so I do, do want to say that we understand that we hear that. And, and as we pick up our pace and as we try to get value into the product more frequently, 
Um, and, and we, you know, we try to push people to be on the latest and greatest versions uh, for stability and security reasons. We, we need to figure out how to solve some of those problems. So we've got some ideas um, and we'll continue to work through those. One of the things that, um, you know, is obviously a factor for a lot of developers is that with a new version every year, they've got to spend an enormous amount of time and energy, which is actually money because it's billable time they can't be using. Uh, just getting certified for each new version has that ever come in been factored into any kind of decision on this uh, you know to be honest um we don't really look at certification as sort of the the driving factor to um to slow down development but you know there <clears throat> excuse me any if anything maybe we need to sort of uh, think about um, certification in, in a different way, but that would sort of be like the tail wagging the dog, I think. Right. And the other thing, obviously, um, nobody's writing books on FileMaker. There used to be a plethora of them, and I, I write books and publish them on the iTunes store, but nobody seems to be buying books, and with constant changes, um, nobody's got the time to write up and keep you know, keep in keep up to date with all the new versions. Have you noticed that? I uh, yes, I, I definitely have noticed that. I, I just I don't know. I think it's just the nature of how fast tech is moving these days. Yeah, I think we're kind of moving to a more of a blog world than a book world. Well, I think yeah, I think so too. What can you tell us and, and about the move to push everything to the cloud? Because it's a little bit confusing for those of us. What exactly do you does this mean uh you know uh essentially it is it's one of those things like i said our job as product managers is to look at out and see what's um, going on out there in the world of technology and it's just clear that um that this is the direction in order to be even considered especially by new customers is they don't necessarily want to install a server or convince IT to do that. And, you know, cloud, public cloud has become a commodity. Um, with elastic computing, we essentially have unlimited computing power and storage at our fingertips. And it enables some very powerful uh, things for, you know, mobile and web deployments to being able to access, um, you know, a lot of data and be able to, you know, uh, do AI and machine learning on top of that. And all of those services are essentially coming from the, the cloud economy. Um, and our intent is that FileMaker continues to live on into the future indefinitely, which means that we've got to keep an eye on that. We could have the greatest product in the world, but if no one wants to install uh, you know, fat uh, clients onto uh, desktops and laptops, then you, you end up not having customers, right? So I think it's it's more to that. You know, my excitement more for the cloud is not so much, and it's, I think, big enough as it is to help with the deployment um, and making it just really easy to go up and running is all of the things that you can tap into once you're in that environment from things like microservices to Lambda functions uh, to integrations and you know, uh, the, you can, you know, you can rent uh, now the algorithms that, that Google and, and Microsoft and Amazon have spent millions and millions of dollars on at, on, um, you know, sub pennies to be able to leverage them into your, your product or platform, ones that we could never hope to build or would take us a decade, they're just available. And so it's, it's such a big, broad world out there that, uh, and that the, um, that the cloud enables, it's just, it's compelling. And, and Robert, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No, I think you summed it up well. So here's a question. This is a loaded question. Um, FM Live Code is now written and released a compiler which will turn any FileMaker solution into an Android application. I haven't looked at this, so I can't really talk intelligently about this. But since this has now been done, do you think this is something that FileMaker might do in the future, either by buying their technology or developing it internally? Uh, we can, obviously can't make any comment on future things. The thing I can tell you is that um, 
having FileMaker run natively on Android devices is is not something that is out of the question. Um, we certainly understand if you're not on an iOS device, you're probably on an Android device, and Apple certainly you know isn't dictating to to us. So I think it's within the realm of possibility, uh, but certainly have nothing to. And we are aware of Life Code. I think we've talked to to the guys just at you know places like DevCon and, and stuff, and and uh, you know kudos to them for pulling that off. Um, Robert, anything else to add to that? Nope. I mean, it's as Rick said at the beginning. You know, it's a top feature request. Uh, we understand. Uh, how businesses run with especially bring your own device and and the lack of control over what devices that they're bringing in uh and as well as the use cases that are necessary that you know web direct is a great answer for that in, in a lot of cases but in situations where you need to tap into the capabilities of the hardware uh that's where uh it's missing so we're fully aware of it and as rick said you know not something that's off the capability off the possibility one of the things that i've noticed uh and the I don't know quite what you call it, but you have the ability in FileMaker to uh, bring up guidelines for the different screen sizes and devices you're using, like the iPad and the iPhone and everything like that, which is fantastic. But there hasn't been any change to accommodate the larger sizes of the iPad, the iPad Pro at 10.5 and the big one at 12.3. Is that something that has been overlooked or just not where does it stand? Because it would be very helpful to have that, those extra guides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th this one's a tough one for me because it so for sure is not being overlooked. Um, I, I'm I'm well aware of it, and it it really comes down to we want to do it better. Like like we could go in and and start adding the stencils. It's as you see devices coming out, you know, from Apple every year. Um, but you know, even uh, looking at uh, you know using web web direct on these different tablets and devices like we would be constantly chasing that um, and updating those stencils and ultimately I don't know that the stencils are even the best approach to that problem so we're well aware of of the uh, the limitations we've got there at the moment um, but uh, just stay tuned I, I think there's going to be a better way for us to approach that that's fantastic great. We talked uh, briefly about card windows and about web direct. Is there a technical reason why that isn't possible as yet? Or is it something that you guys are working on? Or is it just not really that important? Um, so it's definitely important to us. And it wasn't a technical issue. It was more just a, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, we had our, our team working on the cloud. You know, as a when I took over for web direct, I started hearing a lot of um, concern from the community. Like, are you still investing in WebDirect? You haven't done any new features in it recently. What's going on? Um, and the, the truth there is not that we weren't working on it or we weren't investing in WebDirect. It just wasn't in, in ways that uh, were manifesting themselves as features. You know, there was a lot of work that needed to be done uh, as we, we marched towards the cloud, as an example. Um, Card window is something that we're working on, though, and uh, I think it will be a, uh, a big win as far as just not just parity with the clients, but the type of interactions that you can create with a web app and, and meeting your customers' expectations there. Great. So my last question is um, about, we already have the ability to type a percentage in the relationship graph and zoom in and zoom out of layouts and screens. But there are many places where that ability doesn't exist. Calculation windows, inspectors, um, script windows, and for somebody who has getting older, as I am, and ha my eyesight is deteriorating, I sometimes have to peer really dramatically. Is there any possibility that that zoom in functionality will be expand to different areas and perhaps be able to zoom in in 25% increments or zoom out in 25% increments instead of 50? Uh, yeah, so for sure, that's something that we've looked at. It just hasn't um, made it in quite yet. There's lots of, especially when we talk about the you know, like the actual FileMaker interface, you know, all of your dialogues, the Chrome, uh, it's a little bit more tricky there. But uh, again, that's one of those things that we've heard, um, you know, from the community, whether it's through uh, the actual community forum or in person. Um, so the only thing I'll say there is well aware of it. Um, and we're, we're thinking about different approaches to, to solve that problem. Perfect. 
Great. Thank you. You guys, I have a hard stop right now, so I'm just letting you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's been fantastic talking to you. Uh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. And we're done, so that's perfect timing, right? We Thank you so much for coming, both of you. And I'm Michael Rashad. This is John Mark Osborne. Thanks for coming to the Fireside FileMaker, and please put your comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Yep. That's same for me. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Fireside FileMaker, a podcast with John Mark Osborne and Michael Richard. We'd love to hear what you think, so please email us at info at firesidefilemaker.com. That's info at firesidefilemaker.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.